Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. Looking at a classic today, Ed. A, uh, the great American novel, Moby Dick, in comics form. But before we do, where should people find your latest? The news is out, man. You can pre-order uh, Red Room issue number one. It's going to be a Fantagraphics comic. Uh, I have a link tree in the description below where you can uh, hit the link to, to pre-order this sucker. And you're going to want to get that first issue before the movie comes out, man, because you're going to kick yourself in the ass just like you did when you didn't pick up uh, Walking Dead number one, man. So, uh, you know, scoop that thing up. Uh, also, my Patreon is down there. You could... Uh, throw three bucks down, take a look at the issues. Uh, I have over a hundred pages worth of stuff up there at this very moment from Red Room, and I put new strips out every Tuesday. You can find my work at patreon.com slash jimrug. I post a lot of zines and uh, mini comics. Things that are out of print, I post PDFs. One of them is this silhouette zine, which is a, uh, a project I had done a couple of years ago looking at silhouettes in comics, storytelling. There are hundreds of these kinds of... Uh, panels that I've pulled out and rearranged to create a loose narrative, and I've documented all of those uh, as part of that PDF. So patreon.com slash jimrug, you'll find the silhouette zine along with a lot of other comics and comics art by me. It was Moby Dick uh, day at the Kayfabe compound yesterday, man, like read, read three adaptations in comic book <laughs> form, watched two movies. The John Barrymore flick from the 30s, Evil Dead 2 Amounts of Gore. At the, Get out of here! Like, I've never seen that. Like it makes it makes perfect sense why like Jack Valente and all those people like <laughs> kind of came down. And we're like, we need to come up with a rating system because when because <laughs> when Ahab is on the back of this fucking Moby Dick, it plunges this harpoon, just <gasps> eruptions, geysers of black blood, man. Wow! Yeah, I've never <laughs> seen that. That's that's amazing. Uh, good work on the research department, Ed. He wins, by the way, man. It's it's that's that flick is barely Moby Dick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a time period where man was uh, ruling supreme. So, so check it, man. I this is the book. You know, one of my favorite books. Read it several times. Listened to the audio book while working on comics la last year. Hundred thirty five chapters on in this novel. Pretty robust. Uh, so we're gonna take take a look at <laughs> yes. four adaptations that might be fifty hold, pages a piece. Hold up the edges of these things. Not quite a hundred and. Uh, not yet. Not even one page per chapter we're looking at here, man. Yeah, it's interesting. I first encountered Moby Dick in like a children's picture book when I was a kid. So it's definitely a story that gets kind of abridged and, and, and told uh, in a lot of different adaptations uh, from picture books to movies and, and things. There are like, I think Disney did a series, Moby Duck. Uh, certainly it plays a big role in Bone. You know, it's Bone's favorite book. So we get references to it throughout uh, I even pulled a, a piece of Alex Toth Moby Dick presentation art for an animated series. Look at that very uh, characterizations of Moby Dick as, as being a... I don't know how you would sell that as a cartoon, because even there he's like destroying ships and stuff. Right. But point being, Moby Dick's place in history and pop culture, uh, in the American mythos and storytelling, is massive. So there are lots of comics versions. This is, is only scratching the surface. But these are noteworthy for a variety of reasons. Uh, Alex Nino does this Marvel Classics version from 1975 or 76, I believe. Is uh, 1976. Um, there's also a Classics Illustrated from the original run of Classics Illustrated, uh, we don't have that here, but you can find that if you're really obsessed with Moby Dick comics. This is Classics Illustrated from 1990. This was, uh, I don't know, about a third volume of those that yeah. came out, and they would assign like really cool artists with this stuff. In this case, Bill Sienkiewicz adapting it near the peak of his powers. Uh, so that'll be fun to look at. And then Will Eisner, who really needs no introduction, I assume, on this station, also throwing his hat into the ring of Moby Dick adaptations. So the way that we frame the conversation is uh, around, I would say, like a fun creative challenge of right. taking, you know, a 400 page, very yes. small font uh, typeset novel. And now, uh, you know, you are given the assignment to adapt this, you know, the great American novel in a circumscribed amount of pages it's it's a cool creative exercise it's it's i mean as you know x-men grand design guy who, who took eight thousand pages of stuff and put it down into 240 this speaks to me as just like a fun creative challenge to try to undertake and you know these are these are jobs like marvel is like we have x amount of pages here's the book uh 
go to town, man. We're going to, we're going to sell a bunch, but you know, this is the amount of pages we have. Will Eisner's a workhorse, you know, NBM comes to him and is like, you know, you got 64 pages. Uh, do Moby Dick. After you pick yourself up off the ground to try to figure out how the F to do that, then, uh, then, uh, you get to work. Now check this out. Go to page one. One of the most famous opening lines <laughs> in American literature, call me Ishmael. You gotta have that. You do have to have it. Let's look at these page ones. Yes. And I uh, see it. Man, Sienkiewicz is just madness. Madness from the get-go, but of course, the uh, actual beginning, call me Ishmael, of course, everybody's going to have that on their page ones. You say that, but Will Eisner was his own boss for far too long. Oh no. And he's going to teach Herman Melville a couple of things. <laughs> oh, I have not seen this Will Eisner one, so... so oh, man. So he, he, he gets into shit for a long time, and uh, it ain't call me Ishmael for... Ever? For quite a while. It's... Is it... Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm not seeing it, man. <laughs> I feel like he should be introducing himself on the ship, shaking hands. Call me Ishmael. <laughs> it's there somewhere, <laughs> but it ain't on page one or two. All right. Well, I'm going to I'm going to flip through some of this Alex Nino. You know, we talk about like don't make a blue sky. You're you're on a whaling ship. Like every panel has a sky, so one of the fun things in this one is pay attention to how much mileage he gets out of color. Yeah, sure. But another thing is like when you have this I need to see what your Queequeg looks like. Yes, yeah. I, I need to check that Queequeg design. Same with Captain uh, Ahab. You know, it's another one of those iconic, like, how do you draw a mad whaling ship captain on a on a peg leg? You know, um, but look at the ships. You um, know, like, this is beautiful stuff. There's a lot of Kriegstein in some of his water and ship uh, Ninos. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sort of uh, bummed out that I couldn't dig out my uh, my copy of the, uh, the 1946 uh, Classic Illustrated uh, because all of these are influenced very much by the Gregory Peck uh, right. uh, sort of um, characterization of Captain Ahab. But that 1946, what comes out before the movie, so you get to see oh, what a different interpretation right. of... Like, even this right here, man. Like, this is my mom's that she passed down to, to me. That's still got the Gregory Peck energy to it. You know what I'm saying, man? So it's interesting to see how, like... The Hollywood inflection upon this. It's kind of like Frankenstein, right? Like you think of Boris Karloff with the flat top head. Like there's no no indication of that in the book whatsoever. It's much closer to the Bernie Wrightson. But just to speak to the impact, look at those colors, baby. Yeah. I think this is one of the coolest things. Whenever I, I was first gathering these up, it's like, man, it's tough to go against Bill Sienkiewicz. Nino looks amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a fun, like, kind of illustration job for him. The, the thing that I give... Oh, yeah, this is, like, another sequence that you see and everything, where you got to you gotta establish that these guys are very competent whale, whalers. I find this stuff fascinating, and there's a great sequence in that Smithsonian cartoon, the, the comic strip book, from Wash Tubs, where Roy Crane, there's a whaling ship sequence, and that's what they're doing. Like, they're processing the whale and cutting these giant slabs of lard or whatever that is off, you know, the blubber and turning it into whale oil, cooking yeah. it. What, like what, what these guys were doing, these are basically, these are, you know, oil, this whale oil is the gasoline of the 1800s, man. Right. It's power in your lamps. It's power in, uh, you know, glycerin, like soap comes from it. Like it's, it's probably one of the most important aspects of like day to day life. Candles are, are, made from that and one of the big that's a great silhouette one of the uh one of the big pieces in moby dick is i think of those 140 plus chapters something like 50 of them are just like the technical part of whaling it's so and that's what you see here is like they dig a hole in the wells you know in in, in the well's head and they dip buckets in to pull this stuff out this valuable uh li liquid gold that oil that they're pulling out of the wells hang it up on the side of the ship it's it's pretty incredible and there's your key key keg uh, design as he's going over the side to rescue somebody who had fallen into the well's head, pulls him out, has to cut it, cut it open and pull him out because he had fallen into that hole with the oil. <laughs> That's some dark stuff. But again, man, look at these skies, like really trying to come up with ways to make that look interesting, not just in the drawing, but in the coloring as well. Sure, sure. But that drawing, man, like is nothing to sneeze at. I can't help but think that like Toddlebin, the yeah. set kind of, kind of took a look at this kind of line work and also 
we you never get more than these four panel pages. Mm -hmm. These are hard to compose inside of. They are. It's a weird shape, and it's a shape that a cartoonist isn't really used to that much, man. You can see some examples. Kirby went through these four panel things in, in kind of in the mid to late 70s, yeah. and then Byrne copied it for a while when he was doing sort of this Kirby riff and, and would talk about it, and you, know, you can find it in interviews. You pointed out that line work, Ed. I would say look at the contrast because, again, like the lines are going to describe how do you describe water, how do you describe sky, different uses of, uh, of line work to do textures of water and sky. So, like, I when, like the lettering, too. It, this is another example of mechanical lettering, uh, which I think can work. It's a chip track, yeah. this, this, this thing, man. It gives it a certain, uh, you know, this is a classic, so let's separate it, give it some kind of prestige compared to your average comic book. So on all of these, man, we need to see, like... Look at how sick Ahab is, too, and again, most of that's color. And and uh, in this one, not not so great of an intro, like, like uh, you need to have a good intro. Like, the, here are the things that I'm, I'm looking at, like, when going through these. Uh, I need to see what your Queequeg looks like. I need to see your Captain Ahab intro. I need to see that little bit of whaling stuff because, I mean, there is yeah. so much. You learn so much about whaling and from all kind of historic um, reviews and context. Uh, it's pretty accurate, like the, the Herman Melville novel. You got to see your Moby Dick battle. You need to see the eye-to-eye -eye piece. And then uh, we need to see how Captain Ahab gets dispatched. Like, so there's like the bits because if you're distilling a giant thing down, the comic adaptation is going to be plot driven it's right. going to be just story beats it's not going to be you're hunting down moby dick yeah it's not going to be any of the subtext any of the uh the richness that's in the melville novel it's going to be a panel to panel narrative check out how he's handling this water into sky they're just the same there's no there's no distinction no horizon visually. line and then here when we get start to get to this big battle the sky's on fire yeah. As, as he's fighting this thing. It's like a demon, man. It's Ahab's demon coming up out of the ground, uh, you know, coming up out of the water, out of the depths of hell as they are fighting this. And this reminds me so much of Kriegstein, mm -hmm. you know, seeing like how he's handling ships on the water. Yeah, a lot of good scale stuff. That's, that's also something that's like really tough that you have to that you have to figure out and not easy to do when you're dealing with this kind of panel count. Yeah, no doubt about you it. You know, you need a lot of these open the sharks. pieces. It's very cool to see like you know, they're casting this this novel as an epic. Yeah. And it's uh, it's pretty fun to see how they do that. It's it's kind of a cool adaptation exercise, I think, as well. Um, this is challenging material. Like, they're taking lots of liberties. Another great pink sky, and then the green as you go down from the, from the sky down into the depths of the water. Yeah, the colorist did some good work here. Yeah, no doubt about it. There's no credited colorist either, so I wonder if it's Alex Nino doing color. Great, uh, great scar. You know, you, like, you really feel the shape of it, how it's kind of cut into his face. Worth noting the color of the scar, too, because it's bright white, same as your well that, that, that he's chasing. And there's your dispatching of Ahab as he's trying to loosen up this rope, untangle the rope, and it gets caught around his neck. You know, he gets, out of, out of the three of these, he, he gets probably the, the... It's not the highest. The, he doesn't get the highest grade. And then this is the also the other thing that you have to remember, uh, and you have to transition into within your 40 pages, that... It ain't Ishmael's story. It's the it's the greatest swerve in American literature, right? Because call me Ishmael is the opening statement. It's Captain Ahab's story. And the only reason that we give a fuck about Ishmael is because he lives to tell the tale. Like, he's the interlocutor, narrator character. So you have to transition out of Ishmael to Captain Ahab uh, cleanly and snappy because Ishmael ain't shit. This is fun. All of these have some kind of notes about the author, of course, Herman Melville. This just ends in the in the middle of a sentence. Not until after, <laughs> not until after what? Just leave me hanging. I'm looking at inside covers and front covers and stuff. No, it's just big typo on there. Classic, uh, classic comic. You know, fun story with with Melville that's in all of these is that he basically died uh, unsuccessful. Yeah. You know, he had fallen out of uh, favor, I guess, in the literary world, and so it was a reappraisal. I don't know, 40 years after his death or something in the early 1900s. That brings him back to prominence. So I'm cutting next to the Will Eisner because I believe this is the '80s. Yes, and and it's smart because you want to you want to save Sienkiewicz for last. You know what? I could be wrong. It says copyright 1998 Will Eisner, mm. but I've started it now, so this is the one we're on. All all six panels. Uh, here's his Queequeg, like really sells the uh, really sells the sharp teeth. But the the intro is nothing like. I mean, it, none of it is. 
that close. It like, is funny what people keep, you know, like the spouter in. We'll, we'll see a sign for that in the in the Sienkiewicz. You know, it's little details that you uh, latch on to, like the signs being a way to create setting or, or uh, let people know where things are going. He must be coloring this, too. This is... His lettering, his coloring, absolutely pretty cool. Yeah, he's given the the complete assignment. If I if I had to guess, I think he's using Doc Morton dyes. I don't think that's watercolor. Uh, just the way that the kind of iridescence of it. That feels like a crime. If you're gonna do uh, Moby Dick, you've got to <laughs> use watercolors, right? Another great silhouette of the ship. Seeing how they tackle that's pretty fun. Too. You see this though? It's it's all it's all six panel grids, like very very structured. Uh, the intro to Captain Ahab is going to be on the next man, and it's a great intro. It like he's. He's pulling from Gregory Peck in a, in a big way. Not here. Abe Lincoln. Right. right. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that's a, that's a good intro. Um, you still got the same whale blubber sequence as you go. You can just keep rocking, man. Um, good uh, water texture. It is, although I find this color palette much more tame. Sure. You know, less adventurous. Um, which is to be expected. Eisner's not, not a guy who spent a lot of time working in color, so it's cool to see that this is a painted... I, I don't know how many other painted graphic novels he produced, so that part is a pretty nice surprise, but I don't know that it's up to the challenge. Um, I am impressed by the Alex Nino version. Yeah, sure. In terms of color, especially. Man, I, I, I love these... The, the whaling stuff, again, I found this whenever I was a little kid, and for me it was a monster story. Sure. And, uh, you know, it's always stuck with me for that, that reason, and it's kind of cool to see it here. He's got... Uh, that's, a, that's a fun panel, looking through the portal. He's got this part where Ahab is like, the coin is mine! Like, you know, like the coin that he put up. I'm keeping it. I saw him. Yeah, Darcy blows. Man, how hard is it to draw a ship, too? I feel like we're taking for granted that these ships have looked good in both versions. Yeah. And keep that, who keep, knows, man? Maybe they have models that they're referencing, but that is not an easy thing to draw. Keep that shit in silhouette as much as possible, man. But we're going to... We're getting there, dude. Oh, yeah, that's the other part that you got to get. You got to get the eye to eye. You know, that's an important Moby Dick piece. Yeah. Wow. Wait till you see him get dispatched, man. Like, I, 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 like, I like his kind of better than what we saw with... Uh, I like some of the like the directional devices. Some of the stuff that he does in the water is is really striking for a page composition. Right. <laughs> Here we see the starting to be dispatched as that rope comes untangled. Yeah, it's so good. And in the in the Gregory Peck flick, it's so awesome because the, Moby Dick already has a million har harpoons and like uh, ropes and stuff like hanging on him from like past past uh, kills right. and shit. So like. Gregory Peck gets on top of him, starts, starts jabbing at him, gets tangled up, and is almost, like, crucified on the side of Moby Dick for, like, the last 15 minutes of the movie. Like, they go underwater, and he's just a corpse, <laughs> and there's just this, like, little stick figure stuck to the side of Moby Dick. That's good stuff. It's, it's real hardcore. Yeah, the, uh, all the harpoons and stuff, you know, that's something that's mentioned in here. Like, I think three, three boats go out for Moby Dick, and they all land their harpoons. Like, it's pretty violent. The, the kid's story that I read when I was little was kind of scarred me that way because, like, <laughs> it's blood and stuff. You know, it's a painted story, and it's all bloody. Um, I love this title page. I think that's the coolest thing with the human eyeball, you know, connecting your, your Ahab obsession with the whale. Yeah. And the tiny little bit on top. The blue and the oranges, like, you're going to see some cool color in this. A lot of it's painted. There's some drawing. You know, I mentioned the uh, the spouters in sign. Got to have that in there. If anybody could could capture some of the Melville subtext within, you know, a short amount of time, it's Sienkiewicz visually, because he just, he, he thinks on an extra level when it comes to arranging his visuals. Oh, here's his Queequeg. David Lynch is in there for some reason. Yeah. I guess because he worked on that Dune adaptation. <laughs> yeah, pretty, pretty cool looking uh, as we get into some of these characters. This also reminds me of something, um, you know, like pre-electricity light. It feels like it's very present here. I always yeah, think nice of uh, light there will be candlelight. blood whenever uh, Daniel's going around to the towns and having town meetings, and it's at night after everybody's worked, and it has this kind of like weird lighting. It's you know it's good you bring it up because it makes sense for the story because those candles that are in that are lighting it, I mean that's from whale yes, oil. Exactly. Like it's, it's it's crucial to everyday life. Interesting choices as you go through and see him mixing media. And I can't tell you narratively exactly what's behind these choices. Probably a lot of intuitive decision making. Like this is 1990 is the release date for this book. If you study Sienkiewicz's, like I don't know, from 84 to 94, say, extremely prolific. 
So he is kind of turning these pages out pretty quick, yeah. relatively speaking. But man, they look cool. Uh, DJ Chichester, co-author of this adaptation, this is published by First Publishing. Uh, wow, it might be one of their last things or something. It could be, and it's distributed by Berkeley Publishing, which is bookstore distribution. Um, I mention that because it feels like Eclipse had that same kind of goal around this time of like, how do you get these things and how do you get comics into bookstores? And uh, a few publishers were really trying to do that. And interesting, I mean, you know, we look at like those Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle books that first put out. I would find those in bookstores back in the day. So yeah. they had figured out some bookstore distribution, and I think that's what they were aiming for with this. Yeah, you know what? It's, it's funny you mention that, man, because I just recall some conversations with, with Gary Groth, my publisher of Fantagraphics, uh, and... My, By the way, Mike Gold would uh, come. No, no blue in those skies. Yeah, like Mike Gold would come and have meetings with him and stuff to try to work that out. Look at that, man. That's a good Ahab. There. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, connecting Ahab to this whaling obsession is definitely uh, a, a big key to what Sienkiewicz is doing here. Man, and I don't know if you can see it, but like, it like splatters of paint and stuff and, and just dark on dark, white outlines. It's really cool visuals in this. A lot of words too. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the writer's got to try to try try to, you know, punch upward to match Sienkiewicz. That almost reminds me of like an Alan Moore or something. You know, the the, the mad character great, ranting on the ship. Great page, all those teeth and stuff. And you know what? I think I think that's a very real kind of obsession. Uh, there, one of the guys from Hall and Oates was on Howard Stern. Uh, in an interview, and he got Lyme disease from, from, from a tick, from a deer, and he said that, like, every time he sees a deer, he just wants to freaking stab every deer in the head and, and kill them all because he's so miserable and so tired and stuff from this Lyme disease. So there's some real stuff there. I've never been traumatized by an animal. Yeah, I always think of that, like, uh, sometimes you'll see somebody, like, a, like a, someone tries to kill somebody, and the response to that is almost primal. And yeah. it'd be the same kind of deal of, like, I don't know, once your life is threatened, so, you know, I, I can't anticipate how I would react to that. You know, right. I think there's a primal thing that comes from that. I know a lot of dog bite victims that, that are real freaked out by animals and stuff. Yeah, I had a dog bite me in the face once, and it really uh, it took me a long time to be cool with dogs. I'm still not 100% cool with dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Big dog, I'll stand up to pet them. Uh, the different whales... Which reminds me of the book in the sense of, like, the technical stuff. Right. You know, making diagrams of what these different wells are, how they size up, what the oil, what good oil is. Like, these right wells, lousy oil. <laughs> Just think of how the fucking badass these guys were figuring that stuff out, man. Killing yeah, it monsters. it seems like an impossible, impossible uh way to make a living you know like you're just going to go out and sail around the world with and, a bunch and, of toothpicks yes and fight <laughs> these things that are the size of your boat maybe even bigger but there's your blubber you know like calling the blubber and, and turning it into oil an integral part of making this kind of thing and the barrels of oil i like that image i feel like that's a really interesting image yeah yeah eisner captured a good one in, in his man where it just shows that like you you needed to sell that it's a very profitable they like they've done enough They're, they've all they could live for a year on what they just did, but Ahab is just not happy with it. And one of the big discoveries reading the novel back in the day was, like, these guys would be on the boat for years. They oh, wouldn't yeah. touch land for, like, how much provisions and stuff you got in there? How much fresh water? How do you do that stuff? Well, I mean, they would land, but it wouldn't be at home, and it wouldn't be, uh, you know, it would just be to take on some of those provisions. I, I guess, Melville man. talks about, you know, because he did whaling and, like, got off in Tahiti or somewhere because of the tyrannical captain. So I'm sure once you're on that ship, it is just a different... Who knows? That's international law. Law totally. of the captain. Uh, Key Keg, whenever he gets sick and has that coffin made, but uh, makes a recovery, of course, but kind of an iconic piece because in the end, Ishmael's going to be floating on that thing. Look at that. Like getting into the obsession of the, of the captain and getting his harpoon right and ready. That's pretty weird coloring. Yeah, it feels like 60s or so, you know, it feels totally. ruined for the time period. Yeah, I feel like that's a, a moment of the Beatles, like, tripping in India. Right. <laughs> going With back the Maharishi. Through. I also was reading, like, these guys would get, like, a 300th of the profit that comes off the boat. Right. So, you know, like, 0.33%. Yeah, yeah, Captain gets 10 they get that little percentage, but it's still good. That's, that's your wrestling stuff, too, in the old days of, like, you know, how do you break up the gate? That's right. what the wrestlers are going to get, you know, a piece of. Look at that for really good water. 
mixed media bringing in things like maps. I don't know if that stuff's like pasted down onto the, you know, this is another one where show me what the originals look like. Yeah. You know, are these separate paintings that he's then composing visually and then, you know, part of it is paint, but then you're drawing with ink. Is that on the same thing? I, I bet it's I bet it's on heavy duty illustration Pencil. board. Photocopy? Looks like it, right? Crazy mixed media stuff. This is like the iconic piece. When if you type in Bilson Kevich Moby Dick, like you're gonna see that image. Yeah. This is your abstract. This is this is you know your well mouth abstract of of the Moby Dick monster just filtered through that illustrator's paintbrush. Very uh, almost impressionistic. I love the boat being crushed and all the figures just going flying. Yeah, and it's funny because like I think that's Queequeg right there. Like you can like tell. He phases out so much in the second half of this story. It, it's very peculiar, and it's consistent in both of these adaptations, where the he book, just becomes, you know, a, a, an afterthought almost. Yeah. And here you're starting to see some of the pieces, right? As, like, they're all throwing their harpoons, several lines coming off of Moby Dick's tail as he's making his plunge, even one guy tangled up. Captain Ahab making his, uh, his final attempt. It was a little toothpick. And then plunging off into the depths. Very tasteful. Yeah. Very, uh, kind of an interesting piece in Sienkiewicz's portfolio. Yeah, just, you know, got easy money. Well, I don't know about easy, but it's a it's a job. Like, the comic's going to sell. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I love finding this kind of stuff. Like, I have a list of Sienkiewicz's work from, again, it's like a 10-year period where he does a lot of stuff. A lot more than I realize at first glance and you start digging and it's like pretty significant like you know doing a, a moby dick adaptation is uh is not a small thing and there you see the first ads to give some uh some context of some of the other classic illustrated they're doing but what's that next to lone wolf and cub so early manga at the same time and new cover illustrations by dark knight artist frank miller and moby dick artist bill sinkevich <laughs> moby dick artist <laughs> I have a few of these. Here are a couple of the other titles that, that have come out here. Through the Looking Glass is Kyle Baker. Mm -hmm. It's a really good one. Um, and I recently picked up a uh, uh, secret agent, the Joseph Conrad. It's not listed here, but uh, Joseph Conrad, and it's by John K. Snyder III. Makes sense. And, That's and good. looks really neat. Yeah. So there's your uh, a couple of Moby Dick comic adaptations. As we said, you can find certainly many more of these, but it's it's... I love how different the three of them are. We did it really speaks to what an adaptation can do if it's coming from a rich source material like something like Moby Dick. We did a couple of uh, episodes before, man. Todd McFarlane and Marshall Rogers doing a GI Joe issue. We did Alex Toth and uh, Nick Cuddy or somebody like doing some, you know, small story for Charlton. Uh, it's fun to see these kinds of things because you see where the creators kind of place their value, what's important to them, uh, with these rigid. Um, parameters. That's an added piece that makes uh, this these this trio of uh, comics like really fun uh, to to look at. Like I said, it was a Moby Dick day in the in the studio yesterday, and I had dreams of white whales, Jimmy. <laughs> That's all I've got for this one, Ed. But uh, yeah, very fun to go through these. A little bit different than our usual uh, reading materials. But uh, it's still three artists, very good artists, and completely going in different directions. Yeah, man. What do you say, dude? Get out? Yep. K Favors, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. What you got, Jim? Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. You can find my out-of-print zines and mini-comics there. You can find lots of process, art, notes, writing, all kinds of stuff at Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. Got a link tree in the description below. You can pre-order Red Room issue number one from Fantagraphics straight away. It's going to come out in May. Uh, the Patreon that I have, patreon.com slash Ed Piscor. I'm serializing the Red Room strips up there. So you could, uh, three bucks, take a take a peek and read ahead if you if you wish. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video to keep up with everything we have going on. You can find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. This begs the question, Jimmy. What does your Queequeg look like? <laughs> Give them some marching orders, man. Read more comics. <laughs>